The CSIRO just dropped a new draft of their annual GenCost report. Q Chris Bowen coming out swinging against nuclear, saying the report confirms renewables are the most affordable way to modernize our grid. And the media were quick to jump on the bandwagon. But does the CSIRO's latest analysis of nuclear and renewables hold up to scrutiny? We've shown you the questionable assumptions the CSIRO has previously made about coal and nuclear. In this video, we'll do a deep dive into the 2024-25 GenCost report. We'll show you how the CSIRO still hasn't fixed their nuclear analysis, and we'll take you through their incredibly opaque and at times self-contradictory cost estimates for renewables. So first things first, nuclear. In our previous video, we called out the CSIRO for making unreasonable assumptions about nuclear's lifespan and capacity factor. But according to Bowen, the CSIRO's latest draft addresses this. When they brought their report out last year, Ted, as is his perfect right, I went to them and said, I think you've got it wrong about how long nuclear reactors last and how often they're used, their capacity factor. And the CSIRO and AHIMO, to their credit, have listened to Ted, run the numbers on his suggestions and found that his criticisms have no basis in evidence and it doesn't change the costs. For the economic life of nuclear plants, GenCost previously assumed 30 years despite modern plants lasting for 60 or more. But the CSIRO now includes an analysis over a 60-year period. According to GenCost, factoring in nuclear's longer lifespan reduces costs by 11% or 9% with refurbishments. But GenCost also claims wind and solar would show a similar cost reduction of 7% over the same time period. Why? Because the CSIRO assumes wind and solar capital costs will dramatically fall over time, making solar panel and wind turbine replacements cheaper in the future. But there's one major chunk of costs the CSIRO forgot to add to their wind and solar estimates, storage. If you own a smartphone, you know that batteries don't last 60 years. You'd probably have to replace all the batteries needed to support wind and solar at least three times during that period, and that would not be cheap. Regardless, this little analysis doesn't matter because for the headline figure quoted by Bowen in the media, the CSIRO still gives nuclear an economic life of only 30 years. But what about capacity factor? Didn't they fix that? No. The CSIRO still gives nuclear a wide range of 53 to 89%, which makes nuclear look a lot more expensive than renewables. A capacity factor of 53% would mean we'd pay billions of dollars to build a nuclear plant providing reliable electricity, only to switch it off half the time to make room for weather-dependent renewables. In reality, the average nuclear capacity in the US is 93%, so 90% and above is definitely achievable. Ironically, the GenCost authors admit that brown coal is almost always on achieving a 90% capacity factor because its low fuel cost allows it to underbid other generators. And guess what else has a low fuel cost? That's right, nuclear. According to the CSIRO, nuclear fuel will be even cheaper than brown coal in coming decades. So GenCost isn't even internally consistent when it comes to capacity factors. Now, let's take a closer look at the CSIRO's cost estimates for renewables. These charts show the cost breakdown for different levels of wind and solar penetration if they were built in 2024 and 2030. Now, the 2030 analysis excludes $40 billion worth of transmission, storage, and peaking gas costs, so let's ignore that one and focus on the 2024 analysis. So looking at the categories for the 90% wind and solar cost estimate, we've got storage, synchronous condensers, transmission, spillage, and generation, which all add up to $126 per megawatt hour. Number one, storage. GenCost estimates storage would cost around $18 per megawatt hour, but this is a serious underestimate. We looked at the amount of storage required to support a 90% renewables grid in the 2024 Integrated System Plan, the energy market operator's official master plan for decarbonizing the grid. You can check out the details of our analysis below. In summary, to increase storage levels to what the ISP says is required for achieving at least 90% wind and solar, storage costs would actually end up being around $25 per megawatt hour, 40% more than the CSIRO claim. We don't know what causes this discrepancy because the CSIRO won't release their calculations. Keep watching to find out why. Number two, synchronous condensers. A synchronous condenser is a big machine that helps the grid withstand the instability caused by high penetrations of renewables. Think of it as a flywheel with lots of inertia that helps smooth out any sudden fluctuations in supply. 
In the current grid, coal, gas and hydro plants have large turbines that help maintain stability as a byproduct. So how much would we have to spend on synchronous condensers to support renewables? According to GenCost, basically nothing. Synchronous condenser costs make up only 0.3% of the total cost estimate. You practically need a microscope to see them on the graph. This is because the CSIRO assumes lots of gas generators will be running to provide the system stability needed by the grid alongside hydro. But we don't know what amount of gas GenCost assumes will be available or whether it will be enough to maintain system stability because the CSIRO won't release their data. It's a secret. <sighs> Number three, transmission. GenCost claims it would cost $23 per megawatt hour. Now, the energy regulator published this chart showing all the transmission projects set to be built between now and 2050, according to the ISP. You can see the vast majority are scheduled for delivery in the next decade. And remember, transmission projects are notorious for cost blowouts. This graph from Frontier Economics compares project cost estimates in 2020 to those given in 2024. Most project costs were wildly underestimated, so you can bet that GenCost underestimates them too. But we don't even know which projects the CSIRO included in the model because they haven't given us the data. You would understand, it's a secret. Number four, spillage, or the amount of wasted energy. Spillage is a side effect of overbuilding wind and solar capacity to increase minimum generation levels. Now the graph tells us that spillage is about $4 per megawatt hour, but hang on a minute, the text says that it's more than $8 per megawatt hour? Okay, I would love the CSIRO to explain how four equals eight, but whatever, let's just go with the graph and assume the text was a mistake. GenCost assumes spillage is only 5% of generation, but according to the ISP, it should be more than double this. If GenCost modeled spillage as closer to 12% generation costs as the ISP suggests, that would push up the renewables cost estimate, but again, hard to check their work when the CSIRO haven't released all their data. It's a secret. Shut up. And finally, number five, generation. GenCost's 90% renewables generation consists of onshore wind and solar farms. There's no offshore wind in the model because it's just not cost competitive. But that didn't stop the Victorian government from committing to offshore wind targets. As we explain in this video, Victorian offshore wind is now baked into the master plan for our grid. But GenCost underestimates how much renewables will cost by only modeling onshore wind. And not only that, but the CSIRO has greatly overestimated renewables capacity factor. For solar, GenCost assumes a capacity factor of 19 to 32%, and for wind, 29 to 48%. But if you calculate the average capacity factors from solar and wind farms in the national electricity market in the last year, as we did in the link below, solar's real capacity factor is more like 20% and wind 29%. Those numbers are at the absolute bottom of the range assumed by GenCost, making renewables a lot less cheap than they appear in the report. But we don't know how much of the 90% renewables generation is wind and how much is solar, because once again, the CSIRO won't release their data. I've got a secret. So bringing it all together, here are the original GenCost numbers with nuclear more expensive than renewables. But despite what everyone claims the report says, the lower bound of coal is actually already cheaper than the lower bound of 90% renewables. Now see what happens when we use more realistic assumptions for coal and nuclear, as we've explained in our previous videos, and we use more realistic storage costs and capacity factors for renewables. The nuclear range is now almost on par with renewables and coal is clearly the cheapest. And looking at the most likely point estimate in each range based on the most likely capacity factor, renewables come out more expensive than both coal and nuclear. And that's without considering these factors, which the CSIRO excludes from their model, some of which would affect solar and wind much more than coal or nuclear. If the CSIRO provided all their underlying data and assumptions, we could properly check their work, but they don't. Why? Because according to the lead author, Paul Graham, the CSIRO doesn't want to contradict AEMO. We've been sort of reluctant to dump a whole lot of that modelling detail out there because we're trying to support AEMO and the ISP process. What we don't want to create is a sort of a competing set of modelling that sits next to the ISP with a whole lot of different, slightly different outcomes. 
we're sort of content to say that as long as our model comes up with similar ratios of storage and similar deployments of solar and wind as the ISP process, which has does much more detail and much more sophisticated modelling than we do, then we're content that our modelling is up to scratch. And we would rather use the ISP as the benchmark and not our, not our work as their benchmark, if you know what I mean. So the CSIRO won't release all their data because they want to use the ISP as a benchmark. But the CSIRO is meant to be policy neutral and the ISP is a plan entirely driven by government policies, especially Chris Bowen's 82% renewables target, which we explain here. And as we've just shown you, GenCost comes up with completely different results to the ISP, which make renewables look even cheaper. So the only reason the CSIRO gave for withholding their data and assumptions doesn't even hold true. Policy makers, the media and the public have put great trust in the GenCost model to tell us which generation technologies are the most cost effective for our grid. But trust must be earned. And until these major flaws are fixed and we get full transparency of all of the CSIRO's calculations, GenCost cannot be relied upon to inform the energy debate.